All right, y'all. I do believe I'm live. Let me pull up my Insta. I do believe I am live on Facebook and I'm live on Insta. I'm just checking my connection. Yes, Instagram, good. Just checking to be sure I'm coming through on Facebook like I'm supposed to. And yes, there I am. All right, great. All right. Almost 2.30. So we're going to get started on time because I'm a firm believer in starting on time. Do you know why I'm like that? Because we would very easily in the joy and glee, we would give our on-time best for something else, <clears throat> for anything else that we cared about. So <clears throat> it's not too much to ask for us to start on time for the work of the Lord. Well, that water is good because my throat was dry. All right, 2.30, so we're going to start. We're going to jump right in because there is a word today. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, O God, for your mighty spirit, for your mighty word. Thank you, O Lord, for opening your hand. Thank you that when we taste and see, we see that the Lord is good. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for allowing us all to see another Father's Day. Thank you that you are the ultimate Father, that there's nothing that we go through, nothing we experience, nothing we question, nothing we struggle with, no mountain that we have to climb that you haven't already climbed first. For you are the Father, you are the Holy One, you are the creator of all things, you are you are the, the sum of it all, oh God. It all flows from Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we are just creatures, oh God. We are just flesh and blood. We are just clam breath. So we thank you for your creation. Thank you for being the perfect Father. Thank you for an opportunity to come before you. We worship you. For truly you are worthy and you have sworn that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we thank you for an opportunity, oh God, just to worship you and honor you. So Lord, I must decrease so you can increase, oh God. So fill me with the Holy Ghost, speak through me, take the wheel, take the driver's seat, let everything be said, be what you want said, that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified, that demons would be terrified and that sinners would be mortified to live one more day without you. Let the word of God, God go forth like a sword to cut the hearts of men and women boys and girls everywhere, oh God, so they would turn from their own way and turn to you to the saving of their souls and to the salvation of their families on this Father's Day. Thank you for it. I'm looking for you to do great things and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow all that receive and believe this prophetic word. In Jesus' name, I pray, believe it, declare it, and receive it. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Oh, there's my sister. Let me say hi to my sister. All right, y'all. Today's live prophetic word on Father's Day is don't withhold your son. Don't withhold your son. What you mean by that, Prophet Taylor? We're going to dive in. I'm going to show you. Let's go to a very familiar passage of scripture, but let's hear what the Holy Ghost has to say today. Mm. But before we get there, let me say this. <clears throat> Everybody that's watching me now, if you're a father, go get your children. Go get your children right now. If you're watching me live, go get your sons, go get your daughters. Sit down in front of your device, your phone, your laptop, your tablet, your pad, whatever you're watching me on. If you're a father, go get your children and watch this with your children. You say, Prophet Taylor, they're not in the house with me. Then call them. <laughs> call them on your phone. Get them on a Zoom chat. Okay? Get them on anything that has a split screen so you can watch more than one screen at a time and watch this with your children. Watch it right now. Why you want us to do that, Prophet Taylor? Because everybody, the fathers and the children, 
I mean, moms too, but this is about Father's Day. Need to, needs to hear this. Needs to hear what's being said today. So go get your children. And there's no excuse because you do it for something else. If it was a game you wanted to watch, if it was a TV show you wanted to watch, you find a way. So we're going to hear the prophetic word of God. So find a way to get in the same space with your children right now. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Today's live prophetic word is don't withhold your son. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 22. Very familiar passage of scripture, but going to be some new gems mined today. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis is the first book in the Bible, first book in the Old Testament. So uh, Genesis chapter 2, I am reading out of the King James Version. <clears throat> And I'm going to start at verse 15. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. Stop. Right off the bat. First principle I want to give you is, do you know how many people have missed the full benefit and promise of God because they didn't sit still and let the Lord finish talking to them? What'd you say? I said there are a lot of people that have missed my microphone in the right place. A lot of people that have missed the full promise of God because they did not listen to the full word that God was saying. Sometimes you get people and they get a word from God or they get a partial word from God. Or sometimes you get those super zealous people who learn one scripture, then they run off. They run off half baked. They run off. OK, based on a partial word from God. But the Bible just told you that the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham from heaven the second time. So what we're going to be studying today is the second time. Now, the first time, as we know, if you're familiar with the story, God told Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. And Abraham did that. And Abraham prepared the altar and the wood and the fire. And Isaac asked him on the way, we got the wood, we got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice his son because God told him to. And he had the knife right here. And the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, stay thy hand. Don't do it. Now I know that you fear God. So the first time that, Abraham, uh, that the angel called Abraham, it was to stop Abraham. Abraham was willing because Abraham believed that an Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, even if Isaac died, God was able to raise Isaac from the dead because if God promises something, it doesn't matter what it looks like in the natural. And Abraham proved that he believed that because he was going to sacrifice his son like God told him to. That's the first time. What we're reading today is the second time. And the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham the second time. So the first principle to repeat I want to give you is that Don't run off half-baked with a partial word from the Lord. Do you know how, to, how many people have gotten in trouble? Do you know how many people have built entire movements, entire sections of the kingdom or thought they did on a partial word from God? Sometimes you've got to sit still and let the Lord finish talking to you and get the whole word from God. OK, get the whole word from God. OK. All right. That's principle number one. We're going to move on. Verse 16 and said, by myself, have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou has done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son. Oh, Lord, have mercy. That verse is power packed. I'm going to touch on it a little bit more. When God says here, by myself, have I sworn? Have I sworn? Okay, well, actually, let me go ahead and touch on it now since I'm here. <clears throat> you need to understand that when God first called Abraham, that was in Genesis 12. I'm going to read that right quick. Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 4. The Lord had said to Abram, he was still named Abram before God changed his name. Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. 
I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran or Haran. So when God first called Abram, the Bible told you that man was 75 years old. Here in Genesis 22, where he's getting ready to sacrifice Lot, he's 110, 112, 115 years old. Isaac is at least a lad. He's at least 8, 10, 12 years old. Isaac is here. Abraham fathered Isaac when he was 100 years old. That makes him at least 108, 110, 112 here. Okay. <clears throat> when the Lord first gave that word to Abraham to go from your country, from your father's household to the land I will show you, and I'll make him to you a great nation, it was a promise. But here, God does something that he doesn't do anywhere else in scripture. What God does here that's different, that I want you to be sure you understand, is that God ratifies his promise with an oath. This is next level stuff. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. That when God first called Abram at 75 years of age, he made him a promise about what he would do if he obeyed God. But here, because of the level that Abraham took it to, God ratified that original promise with an oath. And it's something he does not do for Isaac or Jacob. It's something he only does this one time with Abraham. And so the entire promise of God got taken to the level of an oath. He said, by myself have I sworn. And it says later on in Hebrews, God had nobody higher to swear by. So he swore by himself. So in other words, God in the most solemn manner pledged with his own perfection and with his own divinity that he was going to make this thing come to pass. It was an oath. When God first said it, he said, I promise you, Abraham. When he says it here, he says, I swear to you by myself that I'm going to make this happen. So what is the principle there? The principle there is that your relationship with God, your promise, your flow, your everything from God can increase as your obedience increases, as your sacrifice increases, as your faith increases. This is another principle that a lot of believers don't get. This is why you have to hang in there with the Lord. This is why you have to stay with God. Um, those folks used to say, I want to go on so I can see what the end going to be. This is why you have to hang in there with the end, because there's another level of, of connection with God. And the reason that's so important is because of what the rest of the verse says. He said, by myself have I sworn. That's an oath. God gave this man an oath. For because, now stop right there. I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm so tired of hearing people talk about things like, you know, well, God said you the head and not the tail, and God said this, and God said this, and God said that. But they forget to mention your part. They're always mentioning the God part. They always talk about the stuff that God says, but they don't mention your part. They don't talk about the stuff that we have to do. And right here, this verse said, because thou has done this thing, because you <laughs> have done, and stop right there. <laughs> Not too long ago, by a famous celebrity type, celebrity type famous person, it got introduced into the American consciousness that you can reap what you feel. 
It also got introduced. I know my light is bad, y'all. I know my line on my face is still a little bit shadow. I was trying to get my light right. But anyway, it was introduced into the American consciousness that you reap what you feel. It was also introduced into the American consciousness that you reap what you want. I'm not going to mention the name of the person that did that, but a famous type, typey famous celebrity, celebrity famous type, celebrity, celebritious person introduced to the national consciousness of this country that you could reap something because you felt it. And you could reap something just because you wanted it. <clears throat> Too bad what the word says is, the word does not say that you reap what you feel. The word does not say that you reap what you want. The word actually says you reap what you sow. That means you have to sow into the promise that God makes you. And you got so many people running around here with the idea that, well, once God says something, I, I just go on cruise control. Once God says something that it doesn't matter how I live. Once God says something that it doesn't matter what I do. Okay. Like uh, if you tell people what God has for me is for me, and that's not incorrect, but that is incomplete because that sounds like it's open-ended. Okay. In the scripture, there are plenty of examples of people that did not inherit what God wanted them to inherit because of what they did. Okay. That's why I'm so adamant about not having this magic genie concept of God where you give people the idea that all they have to do is rub the lamp, the lamp. All they have to do is rub the magic lamp and say the magic words. And then God's going to do everything you want him to do as if he was some type of genie that was supposed to obey you. We, uh, the Lord don't obey us. We obey him. God don't bow down before us. We bow down before him. God don't follow us. We follow him. There's a surrender and an obedience that comes with the promises of God. But when you tell people stuff like that and make it sound open-ended like that, that's when people started running around thinking, okay, well, I'm good then if the Lord promised me this. But there's people in the Bible that didn't get what God wanted them to have because of what they did. Can you back that up, Prophet Taylor? I wouldn't have brought it up if I couldn't back it up, the first generation that came out of Egypt, the first generation of Israelites, of Hebrews, that came out of Egypt during the Exodus under Moses, okay? God wanted those people to inherit the promised land. God wanted them to be giant slayers, giant killers. God wanted them to be conquerors, overcomers, God wanted them to be land owners, land possessors. And God said he was going to drive out the nations from before them. That first generation of people, they never made it. Uh, they sent 10 spies. Joshua and Caleb came back with a positive report, with a faith report. They said, we are well able to overcome. And the rest of them spies was like, we can't do it. Oh, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. Too many giants, they're greater than us. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And they moaned and they complained. And they, they spoke all that unbelief. Even though God had given them miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, they got to the edge of the promised land and said, we can't do it. And everybody from that generation, except Joshua and Caleb, died. And God took in the people that were under the age of 21, plus Joshua and Caleb. All the other people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years till they died. Let that hit. God promised them people that they was going to go in that land. And that first generation didn't make it because of what they did. They didn't believe God and they didn't obey God. They didn't make it. Okay. You want to know somebody else in the Bible who didn't make it? That would be Esau. Esau was the firstborn son of Isaac because Jacob and Esau were twins. And Esau came out first and Jacob came out with his hand on his brother's heel. Well, that means that Esau had the birthright. Esau had the promise that was made to Abraham and Isaac. Esau was next in that uh, secession because he was the firstborn. 
So that had two components being the firstborn. One component was a spiritual component, inherit the, inheriting the blessing that God had put on the family. And the other was the financial component, inheriting the wealth, because the oldest brother was supposed to take care of, if the mama survived, if your mother was still alive and your father had passed, as the oldest brother, you're supposed to take care of your mother and then give a portion to your brothers and your sisters. So in effect, you kind of took on some of the daddy function if your father died and you were the oldest child. Esau was in line for all that. And Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup to his brother Jacob, and he missed it, and he never got it back. It was his by birth, and he never got it back. All the promises God had put on Abraham and Isaac, God even refers to himself later on as the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And Esau didn't make it because he spit that birthright away from him like it didn't mean anything. You want another example of somebody in the Bible that didn't make it? King Saul. The nation of Israel came before God and told God that they wanted a king. God told them, you don't need a king, you got me. He said, no, no, we want a king. God said, you don't need a king, you got me. He said, no, no, we want a king because all the other nations got kings. We want to be like them. Why can't we have a king? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so God said, okay. And Samuel was very hurt and upset because Samuel knew what that meant. But God told Samuel, don't take it personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And God allowed them to have a king. They picked the first king. And the first king they picked was King Saul. And they picked him because he was tall and nice looking and from a good family, not because he was a good man. Turns out King Saul was wishy-washy with God. King Saul was double-minded. He wanted a little bit of God and a little bit of Saul and a little bit of spirit and a little bit of flesh and a little bit of faith and a little bit of sight and a little bit of what God say and a little bit of what the people say. And God got tired of that. Because God don't like wishy washings. God don't like you being in and out, back and forth. God needs you to make up your mind. And you know what God did? God said to Saul, I didn't want the monarchy. And if I had chosen the monarchy, I wouldn't have picked you. Yet, if you had obeyed me, I would have established your house forever. Oh, every time I read that, it just hits me in the chest. God said, I didn't want this situation and I didn't want you in it. But if you had just obeyed me, I would have established you and your house forever. But because Saul was double-minded, God took the kingdom from Saul and gave it to David. And God said, I found a man after my own heart. He shall fulfill all my will. In other words, I found someone. Either that means David's heart is like mine, or it means David chases my heart. And then God said, he shall fulfill all my will. In other words, this man will do what I need a king to do. That's why he picked David. He took the kingdom from Saul and gave it to David, and Saul never got it back, and all of Saul's bloodline was wiped out except for Mephibosheth. Saul didn't make it. He could have made it, but he didn't make it. Last, didn't make it. Last example. Last example is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot had an opportunity to be a part of something that wasn't going to happen once in a generation because the generation is every 20 years. It wasn't going to happen once in a lifetime. It was going to happen once in all creation, the first advent of Christ. Before Jesus came through Mary's room in the Old Testament, we have what we call theophonic representations of Christ. What that means is that we have appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament before he becomes incarnate as a man through the womb of his mother under uh, in the New Testament. Okay? But then Jesus comes through Mary's womb and gets wrapped in human flesh and is born as a baby and lives like we do. He was one years old. He had a birthday. He was in diapers. He had learned how to eat. He was sleepy. He was hungry. He lived life as a human. That's God as a man. God in human form. That blows my mind. He picked his 12 disciples to walk with him to be kind of like his lieutenants, you know. And among those, he picked Judas. That means that Judas had an opportunity that only 12 people that have ever lived, not in a generation, not in a lifetime, but ever. There's seven and a half billion people alive on earth right now. So we're talking about all the humans that live before and all the humans that live until God ends this age. That only happened one time. And the Lord picked 12 men to follow him and be his lieutenants. And Judas had a chance to be with that number. And what did Judas do? He betrayed the Lord into the hands of the Roman soldiers. And the Lord told him repeatedly, Behold, I've chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. He said, behold, one of you shall betray me. He told Judas he was doing that because he was trying to warn Judas to not let the devil have his way with him. 
The Lord loved Judas. He was trying to tell Judas, I know what's going on in your heart. Don't open your heart to Satan and let the devil convince you to betray me. That's what the Lord is trying to say. And Judas did it anyway. Judas became guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. That just make me shudder. And Judas lost his place with the 12. He could never get that back. So don't tell me <laughs> that just because God makes a promise that it's open-ended, meaning it doesn't matter how you behave. That's the part many times that's missing. So that's why you got people running around living any kind of way, thinking they're going to inherit the full promise of God. That's not what the scripture teaches. You can blow it. You can mess it up. Okay? You can mess it up. You have to obey. You have to do what the Lord is telling you to do. And that's exactly what this verse says. That's why I'm hitting it so hard. He said, uh, verse 16, it said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because, because thou, because you, Abraham, has done this thing, because Abraham was willing to believe God and obey God on the level of sacrificing Isaac, even though Isaac was the child of promise. Abraham was believing God on the level that if I kill this boy, God going to bring him back. Because if God said, and Isaac shall my seed be called, then in Isaac shall my seed be called. And God was able uh, to raise him from the dead. And the Lord said, because you have done this thing, that's the same language God used on Adam. Remember when God came down to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve were hiding because they were naked? And God said, where are you? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. And God told you. God said, who told you you were naked? And then Adam blamed Eve. And then God questioned Eve. And then Eve blamed the devil. God said, because thou hast done this. Go look it up. It's in Genesis 3. God said, because thou, you, Adam, because thou hast done this. Because thou, you, have done. Because remember, you don't reap what you feel. If Adam had felt like eating the fruit, but he didn't eat it, that wouldn't have counted. You don't reap what you want. If Adam had wanted to eat the fruit, but he didn't do it, that wouldn't have counted. It counted because Adam actually ate that fruit. And God said, because thou has done this, cursed is the ground for thy sake. That's the same language God used before. Because thou has done. So that's why I'm hitting this point so hard that, that, that what God has for you is for you. Yes, but you must obey to get it. It's not open-ended. It's not magic. And it is not in spite of what you do. Okay? You must believe and obey to inherit the promise. But then, and here's what I've been trying to get to, although there's some more to say. Still on verse 16, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Wait just a minute. Oh, that water's good. Thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Several points I want to make here. The first point I want to make is, I want to ask you a question. What are you withholding from God? What are you withholding from God? I am constantly amazed in my walk with Christ. How look like the Lord is always getting down here in my heart, in my sub-basement, in my gut, where I really tick and talking to me about how I really feel, how I really feel way down on the inside. So, Question is, what are you withholding from God? You may think you have surrendered. You may think you have sacrificed. You may think a lot of things. But my question is, what are you withholding from God? Don't you know it's the easiest thing in the world to get to a place as a Christian where you're just going through the motions? I'm going to say that one more time. Don't you know it's the easiest thing in the world as a Christian to get to a place where you are just going through the motions? What I mean by that, I mean, you've gotten so used to your church routine. Stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, raise your hand, speak in tongues, get slain in the spirit, say the benediction, go home, eat some chicken. That's what I mean. You're so used to your routine. 
you're so used to, you know, uh, sometimes you're, you're sitting on the people that preach the same sermon every week. So you can tell what they preach and you can tell when they wind it up. You can list out their points before they make them because they just keep preaching the same thing. Okay. You can get so used to your routine. So used to your routine that you are going through the motions. You're carrying some stuff in your heart and your soul that you have never talked to the Lord about. You're carrying some stuff in your heart or your soul. You've never surrendered to the Lord. You just walk around. Amen. Hallelujah. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. House is on fire, but this is fine. This is fine. Because you're putting on that, that sweet smile, that sweet face, because you don't want anybody to know that things aren't perfect. And you're not even talking to God about what's really going on in here. You just la, 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 living in denial. So what are you withholding from God? That's the question. But here's the part I've been trying to get to. Here's the title of the prophetic word. God said, not thou has done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son. The next principle I want to give you is don't withhold your son. Prophet Taylor, what do you mean by that? I will tell you what I mean on this Father's Day. I mean, turn your son over to the Lord, to the grace of God, to the mercy of God, to the hand of God, because that's your job as a father. I discovered when my children were very, very little, I discovered early on in my parenting that I couldn't be with them all the time. It didn't matter how much I loved them. It didn't matter how it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I could not be with them all the time. So I learned very, very quickly that you either going to trust God or you're going to go crazy. That's why a lot of people just go crazy. Worrying about, you know, running around, trace, uh, chasing around, trailing around after their kids. You can't be with your kids all the time. You can't be with your kids 24-7 and you can't make their decisions for them either. So as a father, you ought to have an altar in your house. You ought to have a prayer room in your house. You ought to have a space in your house that's dedicated to the prayer and the praise and the worship of God. Wherever you live, you ought to have a space in your house that is dedicated to you going before the Lord and you ought to have an altar in that space. And on that altar, you ought to be laying the names of your children on a daily basis. And you should be fasting at least on a regular basis. If you don't fast once, twice, three times a week, at least fast once or twice a month. But there ought to be a, a altar, a space in your home dedicated to meeting the Lord. There ought to be an altar in that space. And in that space, you should be laying the names of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, if you have any. And you also, you also should be praying about children in your family that haven't been born yet. Because that's your job as a father on the spiritual side. We know about the, the natural side, the financial side. Yes, you're supposed to provide. Physical side, you're supposed to protect. We know that. Mental side, you're supposed to train and educate. We know that all of that is right too. Right now, I'm specifically talking about your spiritual responsibility as a dad. Altar in the home, dedicated space in that altar, and on that altar should go the names of your children. And you ought to be fasting at least once a week, twice a week, three times a week, or at least once, twice a month fasting and going before God and crying out to the Lord with the names of your children on your lips so you are not withholding your son or your daughter from God so that God's attention, so the eyes of the Almighty, so the ears of the Almighty are open to your cry and the eyes of the Almighty is upon your son and your daughter because you can't be with them all the time. You can't be with your children all the time and you can't make their decisions for them. And there's a devil out there that doesn't want to do anything but destroy them. I'm going to say that one more time. There's a devil out there that doesn't want to do anything but destroy your children. This is where a lot of people make their mistake. Because you know what some people say? Some people say, not my son, not my daughter. Uh, Yeah, your son. Yeah, your daughter, because ain't no special rules for you. 
people draw all these arbitrary lines in their lives. We draw lines based on skin color. We draw lines based on primary language. We draw lines based on ethnicity. We draw lines based on age. We draw lines based on fame. We show sure draw lines based on money and we draw lines based on attractiveness. That's the way we divide up as people. And so if you are around someone you're attracted to, you treat them different than you do people you're not attracted to. And if you're around people with money, you treat them differently than people that don't have money. And certainly if you're around somebody that you think is famous, you treat them differently than you do people that you think aren't famous. I stopped by to tell you that God don't work that way. And God's kingdom doesn't work that way. There's only one line God draws. There's one line. How many figures I got up? One. There's only one line God draws among people, and here it is. Believers and unbelievers. That's the only line God draws. That's the only line God has ever drawn. Those that believe him and those that don't. That means that your son and your daughter are subject to the stuff that happens on planet Earth. And so if you think your skin color or your last name or your money or your education or your fame or your whatever is some kind of defense against the devil, you are mistaken. None of that is a defense against Satan. The only thing, things that are defenses against the devil, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and faith in that word, okay? Those are the only things that are defense against Satan who's walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's why so many people have had, this is not every tragedy, don't, don't, don't twist what I'm saying. This is not every tragedy, but that's why so many people have had so many things because you thought the devil wouldn't come after your child. Yes, he is. Yes, he is, because he comes after everybody. Your skin color, your money, your family name, your fame, your attorneys, your bodyguards, your education is not going to stop the devil. It's not going to stop the devil. It's not going to stop the devil. What's going to stop the devil is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the true and, true and living God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the word of God. It is written. That's what you got to use when the devil come calling. And that's why you as a father got to keep them kids before the throne of God, that the eye of the almighty stay on your son and your daughter, that the ear of the almighty stays open to their cry, that the hand of the Lord stays over your son, over your daughter, because that's the only defense you got. Because one day, might not be today, one day, devil gonna come calling. And there's nothing outside of Jesus that's gonna stop him. This is what I'm trying to tell you. So don't withhold your son. I don't care how busy you are, we're all busy. I know we're all trying to cover, recover from 2020. I know we are. You have to tell me that we are. The whole world, that was a global pan pandemic. That wasn't a local pandemic. That's a global pandemic. The whole world is trying to recover from 2020 and from COVID-19 because COVID-19 is still here. We're trying to quote unquote, get back to normal. Okay, I understand that. I don't care how busy you are. I don't care how many jobs you working. Okay, take some time at the start of your day. You don't give God your leftovers. You don't, you don't do what you wanna do and then just throw God up some leftovers. Take time at the start of your day in that altar, in that room, and fast at least once a week, or at the very minimum, once a month, and keep them kids, but you need to be before God every day. Why? Because the devil's out there every day, that's why. And keep them kids before the Lord, so that you can ask God to send his mighty angels to protect them. And if your kids ain't living right, you can ask God to have mercy until they get it. Because sometimes God has to protect us with his mercy until we get in line, because you just stay in obedience, you're going to die early. Excuse me, you stay in disobedience. You're going to die early. I can't tell you the num number of people I've seen that I've gone to church with that went off and some of the people never came back and some of the people died before they time. Okay? 
So it's your job as a father. That's what I'm saying. This is the charge I'm giving you on this Father's Day to have a space in your home where you go before the Lord and have an altar in that space and do your spiritual job. Of course, we have to do our jobs in the natural. I'm not saying that that's not a part of it because that's even in the Bible. I'm not saying that. I'm saying on the spiritual responsibility part because a lot of men don't know what I'm saying. And on top of all I've already said, you need to be sure that the bloodline curses in your family are broken. That's your job as a daddy if you didn't know that. See, I see I'm gonna have to put together a teaching just for men, but if you don't know that, there's such a thing as a familiar spirit. It's in the scripture. A familiar spirit is a spirit that's familiar with you. And what that means is that it has tracked your family from generation to generation, if you didn't know that. And the devil brings different temptations and different situations uh, to your forefathers to see what trip them up. Some people got a bad temper. Some people like liquor. Some people just ain't stable. They just don't like to sit down and put no roots down. Some people just lie all the time. Some people are into infidelity, just can't stay faithful. Some people love to get high. But whatever it is, the devil has been throwing temptation and temptation in your family to see what trips up your forefathers. And then you're going to try them same tricks in every generation. That's why maybe grandpa was an alcoholic, and then your father took it to the next level, was lit all the time, and then the son is a super alcoholic. Well, that's a bloodline curse. That's some sin that somebody started two, three generations ago, but they let it in the family and it got in the bloodline, and then it passed from generation to generation. You can break bloodline curses in the name of Jesus. You have to go before God and confess the sin. Whatever sin you're aware of, you go before God in prayer and you tell the Lord for my forefathers and for myself, if I have sinned against you, God, if I have struggled with alcohol and pass that on to my kids, if I've struggled with faithfulness, if you've been cheating on your spouse, if you've struggled with uh, telling the truth, if you're a liar, if you struggle with violence, whatever you struggle with is tends to run in that family. You got to break that blood like curse. You go before the Lord, you confess the sin, and then you ask God to apply the blood of Jesus. You ask God to apply his mercy and ask God for forgiveness for the sins of your forefathers. Retroactively confess sin that was going on even before you were born. Acknowledge it before God that it was wrong. And then ask God to apply the blood of Jesus to the account to wipe the sin clean. And then ask God to apply the blood of Jesus to the bloodline to wipe your spirit and the rest of your children clean so that your children don't repeat the same pattern. Like if there's a pattern, if there's a spirit of divorce in your family, uh, like, you know, last three, four generations, could nobody stay married? You have to go into the heavenlies to God in prayer, confess that divorce spirit and that divorce pattern as a sin. Uh, ask God to forgive you and your full parents. Ask him to apply the blood of Jesus to wipe the sin from the account and then ask him to apply the blood of Jesus to wipe the sin from your spirit. In other words, to cleanse me from a spirit of divorce and cleanse my children so we can stop the curse so it doesn't pass on to another generation. Then on top of all that, sometimes you need deliverance. Deliverance ministry is casting out demons. If it's something that just seems like you can't shake, but it's always some funny stuff going on with it, like you get headaches or there's a, a presence you feel in your home or there's some stuff that it looked like you've got a child just won't act right, look like they can't get their thoughts together, them is demons. It's your job as the daddy to do deliverance ministry. And the way you do deliverance ministry, that's a long, long drawing summary. I'm just giving you a short summation because that's a, that's a lifelong study, learning how to do deliverance. But you have to call out that unclean spirit by name and cast it out and break its power in the name of Jesus. That's your job as a father. So for example, a spirit of premature death. That is a demon. Where it look like your grandfather died at 32 and your father died at 32 and then the devils keep whispering to you your whole life when you were a kid, you're going to die early too. You're going to die early too. That's a demon. You have to say, stand in. The, that's why you have to confess the sin to God first. You got to break the curse first by confessing the sin and ask Father God to apply the blood of Jesus and apply the mercy to wipe it off the account and then apply the blood of Jesus to wipe it off of you. Then you say in the name of Jesus, I shall not die, but live 
and declare the works of the Lord. With long life am I satisfied and shown the salvation of God. You cast out, you rebuke the spirit of premature death. You say in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of premature, premature death. You are broken off me. You are broken off this family. You are broken off this bloodline. You have no power or authority here. In Jesus' name, I cast you out and you may not rest on anybody else in this family. You must leave the area. You break the demon. You break the spirit. But then you have to start confessing the word, the scriptures I just gave you. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And with long life, will God satisfy me and show me my salvation? Show me his salvation? And you start confessing the word of God to break the spirit of premature death. That's your job as the daddy. One more time. That's your job as the daddy. That's why the devil tries so hard to get those things in on the father. Have you ever wondered why? I'll tell you why. Because we have the seed. The reason that we are born in sin was because Adam sinned. And then when he had kids with Eve, the children were born with that cursed sinful nature because seed reproduces after its own kind. That's why in Adam all die. That's why God told Abraham that his seed was going to be blessed because that's the power of being a man. We have the seed. That's why it's your job as the daddy. That's why you have to ask for forgiveness for the sin of your forefathers. And that's why you, you have to ask for forgiveness of your own sin and have the blood of Jesus apply and get those demons broken off and tell the devil it stops right here. And then after you've done all that, you're still not done because now you have to build the new godly thing in the children coming up. If you repeat the same old pattern, then the same thing gonna happen. So you got to break it in the heavenlies, break the bloodline curse, ask for mercy, apply the blood of Jesus, break the demons off of you, cast the demons out, tell them, leave your house, leave your body, leave your family. But then you have to build something new based on the word of God so that you can have a new future, a new destiny going forward. That's why the Lord died to give us that power so that we didn't have to repeat the sins of our forefathers. That's your job as the daddy. Do you understand that? Why do you think the devil tries so hard to keep men away from the Lord? Have you ever noticed that men struggle with coming to church? Men struggle with coming to Christ? Men, do you know why men struggle with all that? Because the devil's trying to give you every excuse in the book. He's trying to do everything he can to keep you away from your power in Christ. Because once as a man, once you surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ as your head, and once you stop, trying to run it yourself and you get obedient to what Jesus is telling you, you are unstoppable. Once Moses got in line with what God told him to do, Moses was literally unstoppable. The sorcerers of Egypt couldn't stop him. The wizards of Egypt couldn't stop him. Pharaoh couldn't stop him. The armies of Pharaoh couldn't stop him. Think about it. Once Moses got into obedience with God, he was unstoppable. That is why the devil fights so hard to keep men away from Christ. Because once you get into faith and obedience with Christ as a man, you are unstoppable. They couldn't stop Samson. Samson got defeated because he got away from God. They couldn't stop Samson. He was unstoppable. They couldn't stop David. David never lost a military campaign campaign. They couldn't stop David. David killed the giant with a slingshot. They couldn't stop him because once they couldn't stop Elijah, they couldn't stop Elisha because once as a man, you get into obedience with Christ, you are unstoppable. You are, un that's why the devil fights men so hard because once you get into obedience with Christ, you are unstoppable. You are on fire, can't stop you. Water can't stop you. Fear can't stop you. Lions can't stop you. Lack of food can't stop you. Geography can't stop you. You are unstoppable if you are obedient to your headship, which is Christ. You are unstoppable. And you have the seed. That's why you got to break the curses and establish the new thing in the bloodline. That's your job as the daddy. 
So I'm going to have to put together some materials for men because I know that a lot of men don't, don't know what I'm saying. And I'm going to throw this out there. All that stuff you've been saying, uh, you know, against pastors and preachers and prophets and apostles and whoever else, that's just an excuse, dog. <laughs> that's just an excuse. You can say this one is, you know, a scammer and this one ain't right. And this one is preaching phony stuff. And this one's a false prophet. And you can say all that if you want to. What's that got to do with you? Now, it had nothing to do with you. You can get to know God for yourself as a man if you want to. Nobody can stop you. <laughs> Nobody can stop you from getting to know God for yourself. So if you've come across people that have been phony or wolves in sheep's clothing, or maybe just disappointed you, okay, that's understandable. Because yes, the Bible itself says that anyone that names the name of Christ should walk like he walked. You are right. That's what they should do. But what if they don't? If they don't, that is no excuse for you. That's not the excuse you think it is. And so many men have used that as an excuse to turn away from God and the kingdom of God and the things of God because they're busy pointing out other men that haven't been right or other people that haven't been right. Yes, there are some people that haven't been right. Yes, there are some people that have pulled scams. Yes, there are some people that have taken unfair advantage of certain people in religious situations. Yes. It has happened and, and it's going to happen again. That is not an excuse. Th that is not an excuse because that don't have nothing to do with you. You can get to know God for yourself. So this Father's Day, I want to issue a challenge to you to not withhold your son. I want to issue a challenge to you to, to do the things that only a father can do because we have the seed and we're the head according to the word of God. So let's review all those things we need to do. Number one, you need to have a space in your home that's dedicated to you having prayer time and seeking the Lord. Number two, in that space needs to be an altar of some kind. It can be a bed, it can be a table, it can be an altar of some kind. It's symbolic. It doesn't have to be a literal brick altar. It's symbolic. When you go before the Lord, number three, you are always keeping your children's names before the throne of God. I do it. Now, at every, every place I'm at, I always tell anybody to listen to me in any avenue, me as a prophet, me as a teacher, me as a writer, me as anything, me as a musician. I always tell you that there's nothing that I'm telling you to do that I'm not doing. That applies here. I, this stuff that I'm telling you, I do this. Okay, I do it, just so you know. Okay, I keep my children before, and my grandchildren before the Lord every day. Every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm before the Lord every day. Every day. Because that devil is out there. And the only defense against him, name of Jesus, blood of Jesus, word of God. And God's got to keep his hand right on my children because God is the only one that can be with them all the time. That's not something I can do. I'm the biological father. I'm the human father. But heavenly father is the one that has the all seeing eye. Heavenly father is the one that never sleeps or slumbers. Heavenly father is the one who's omnipresent everywhere all at once. I can't do that. So you got to keep those names, those names of your bloodline, all the people that are descended from you as the daddy, keep those names before the Lord. Also, we have to ask for forgiveness of sins for our forefathers. So anything that went on before you, like if you didn't know your dad, that might have been a spirit of abandonment. Maybe your father dropped you with your mother and ran. That means a spirit of abandonment got in your bloodline and you have insecurity issues. Because somewhere deep down on the inside, you're saying, why did my dad want me? Because everybody wants to know that. If you ever felt rejected by your dad on any level, there's a wounded little girl, little boy inside of you that says, why did, why did my daddy want me? I don't understand. You need to get healed from that. You have to not withhold that. 
and take that before Father God, take that before Jesus and let him heal you. So any sin in your family on either side, your mother's side or your father's side that you know about, but especially if it was something that went from generation to generation, like breast cancer, like all the women in your family catching breast cancer, stuff like that. That's a curse. That's a bloodline curse. You got to confess that sin. Whoever let it in, whoever listened to the devil, didn't listen to God, or if they did something that opened the door, you got to confess it as sin before God and ask God to apply the blood of Jesus and ask God to apply the blood of Jesus to the account to wipe it clean from before him and apply it to you to wipe it out of your spirit. Okay, but then you got to break the demon off. You got to break the demon off. If there's something that's gripped you your whole life and you've been trying to get rid of it, but you can't be free. Anything that leads you into bondage is not of God because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that is an unclean spirit that has attached itself to you. You got to break the demon off. You got to you got to call it by name. In the name of Jesus, I cast off the spirit of abandonment. In the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of double mindedness. In the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of alcohol. In the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of infidelity. In the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of a violent temper, whatever it is, whatever it is for you and your family, you got to break that thing off you. You got to break it off your kids. Haven't you ever noticed that, that sometimes your kids do stuff that they've never seen you do? I saw my daughter do that one time. It just tripped me out. Sometimes when I'm thinking, sometimes I think with my hands and I do that. I do, I do this little rubbing thing where I just kind of like rub my fingers together. Mm -hmm. One day I saw my daughter do that. And I know she didn't. She never saw me do that. And one day she was thinking she was doing something. She did this right here. That, that tripped me out because stuff just gets in the blood. You know, I know she ain't never seen me do that. And she did that right there. I was like, and because stuff gets in the blood, that's where your kids get that stuff from. So you got to break that demonic stuff off of you and you got to break it off of them. You cannot allow the monthly spirits to settle and nestle and get comfortable with your children because then your children will grow up under that influence and your kids will think it's normal. That's why the enemy likes to jump on you when you're young, because the enemy is trying to make you acclimate to accepting him in your life. And you don't have to accept the devil at no level in your life. If you're a Christian, if you're an unbeliever, you ain't got no defense against the devil and you're under his kingdom. But if you're a Christian, if you, you know, if you're a sinner and an unbeliever, you ain't got no defense against the devil. The devil can take you out whenever he get ready. And he does. Why you think so, so there's so much premature death sometimes. But if you are a believer, you got a right in Jesus' name to not have to live under the influence of the devil. So you got to break that off of your children. But then you got to do one more thing. You've got to establish the new pattern. Abraham offering up his son Isaac, if Abraham had gone through with it, that would have happened one time when Jesus offered himself on the cross, that would have happened one time. It did happen one time when the Lord died. But raising your child is 12, 15, 18, 20, 22, 25 years. It's years. It's years. So if you the daddy and you want to turn that little baby into a fully functioning godly adult, you want to turn that little baby into someone that knows Jesus, loves Jesus, and follows Jesus, that's going to cost you minimum two decades. That's going to cost you minimum, if you're a father, two decades per child. So you got to do all that stuff to get your bloodline free, but then you have to do all that stuff to build I'm not making that up. God said of Abraham in the scriptures, God said about Abraham, I know this man because I've studied him. This man shall teach his children after me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to look that up so I can give you the exact verse. So you can see that I'm not making that up. 
That's Genesis 18, 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. That's God speaking about Abraham. Genesis 18, 19. For I know that he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord and do judgment and justice. That's God giving a testimony about Abraham. Remember how I told you at the top of this prophetic word that you got to obey, you got to do something. You got to put some works behind your faith. You don't just grow, you don't just go on cruise control because God gave you a promise. You have to obey. So God said of Abraham, God said, I study that man, I know him. I know that if I make my covenant with Abraham, he gonna teach his children. I just read it to you, Genesis 18, 19. That's your job as the daddy. <laughs> okay, so you've gone back in the past, you confess the sin, you confess the sin in the bloodline, you apply the blood of Jesus, you ask God for mercy, you apply the blood of Jesus to your own self, you broke the curse in the name of Jesus, you got cleansed by the blood of Jesus, you broke the demons off of yourself, you cast the demons out your house and you broke the demons off your kids. Then you got to build. You got to do Genesis 18, 19 and command your children after the way of the Lord to do judgment and justice. And that's going to take the better part of two decades, maybe two and a half. Get your kids through college, you get them married, get them into a marriage. They might, might be 25 years old. That's your job as the daddy. So I want to offer this word of encouragement to you today on Father's Day. I was just talking to a friend of mine about how there's so many situations now that bash fathers and bash men. I, I'm not bashing men and I'm not bashing fathers. Okay, I'm here to encourage you to let you know how important you are as the daddy. You may have not heard those words recently. You may have not heard those words in your life. If I got to be the only person in America to say that you're a good man and I believe in you and you're important and you make a difference, then I will stand by my black prophetic self. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. All the good men out there, you're, you're a good man. Sometimes being a good man is a thankless job. Sometimes it looks like you get glossed over. It looks like you don't get noticed. And it looks like all the men that are just, you know, bad boys and cut ups and doing all kinds of wicked things look like they get all the attention and you steady holding it down. And don't nobody ever call your name. I stop by to tell you, Father God sees you and that you are needed and that you are loved. And here's the big one. You are respected. And you make a difference. And the stuff that you are pouring into those children are going to live on way after you're dead. There's some things that my father said to me way back when I was a kid, still in my head now, still in my soul, because his ministry to me is still echoing. I tell people all the time that I had a hero when I was young. You know, I love comic books. Love Superman, love Captain Marvel, love all that. But my hero was my dad. I had a hero when I was young and he impacted my life. And that's what I mean when I tell you, you good men, you good fathers. And if you're not a good man and you're not a good father, you can become one through Jesus. The Lord can teach you the stuff you don't know. He can transform you from wherever it was you were to become the man that you're supposed to be. But I stopped by to give you a word of encouragement. This prophetic word was not to bash you, and this prophetic word was not to hate on you. This prophetic, prophetic word was to encourage you and to educate you and to show you how important you are as the daddy. One more time to show you how important you as the legacy holder, as the carrier of the name, as the carrier of the seed, as the head of the house. How important you are as the daddy. So, and to give you some tools so that if there's anything going on in your family that shouldn't be going on, if your grandparents were born out of wedlock and your parents were born out of wedlock and you had all your kids out of wedlock and you want to stop that, I showed you how. 
that you can break all that off your bloodline and start establishing your children to get married and establish families and have all their kids in the same house. And it don't have to keep being like it was however many generations back. Through Jesus Christ, you have that power. I can't stress that enough. It's through Christ, through his name, his word, and his blood. But as a man and as the head, you have that power. You have access to that power. Don't you know that you've got the power to curse and bless with this right here? With one word, you don't have to say stuff at one time because you're the daddy. With one word from your mouth, you can curse your whole bloodline for generations to come. Plenty of men in the Bible did it. And with one word from this mouth, you can bless. You can bless. You can bless your bloodline for generations to come. For generations to come. That's why we read about Abraham, because he obeyed God and got us blessed. How many more gen how many generations ago did Abraham live? We're still living in the benefit of that man's blessing because he believed and obeyed God. You have that power and that potential as the daddy. This is not to bash. This is not to be negative or critical. This is to encourage you. This is to uplift you. This is to tell you that you are loved. You are important. You are respected. And here's another one. You are seen by Father God. They may not see you. When I say they, I mean the people you want to see you on earth. The, the people you want to get recognition, recognition from, you may never get it from. Because being a father sometimes is a thankless job. Being a good man sometimes is a thankless job because being a good man is about being faithful regardless of anything else, about being faithful. When ain't nobody else doing their job, you show up on your post. You show up because being a good man is about being faithful if nobody sees it. But I wanted to encourage you to let you know that the ultimate father, the heavenly father, he sees it. I just showed you Genesis 18, 19, that when you are leading your family as a man of God, God is studying you, God is watching you, and God is going to bless that bloodline as you continue to obey uh, in a way that you could never do on your own. So I want you to be encouraged. Uh, on this Father's Day 2021, regardless of all the other negative stuff, all the bashing and criticism, in spite of all that, I want you to be encouraged to know that you are seen by Heavenly Father, you are respected, you are loved, you are important, and you got the power through Jesus Christ to completely heal your bloodline by applying his healing blood from all the generations back and all the generations going forward. That means you are powerful as a man. You are powerful as a husband. You are powerful as a father. Don't ever let anybody convince you that you are not. Because aren't we still blessed to this day because of the faith of Abraham? Amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> That's our prophetic word for today. Now, remember I told you in, let me see if the Holy Ghost is giving me anything else to say. He is. Hold on. For behold, my children, behold, my men, behold, my fathers. Uh, you are a reflection of me. I'm calling you, says the Lord, to draw close to me and learn me. Many of you men, the reason that you're hurting is because you don't know me. You have thought that that hurt and that pain and that embarrassment and that shame came from me. That's not what I wanted from you. What I want is an intimate relationship with you. What I want you, what I want for you is to know me, to know my love, know my peace, know my wisdom, know my voice and know my grace. And I will heal whatever has ailed you from your past. And I will give you the power to do what I said today during the prophetic word to establish a new thing from me in your generation and bless your bloodline for generations yet to come. So believe my word, believe me, says the Lord, believe that I love you, that I died for you and that I will do this thing for you and come unto me and draw close. Bring me your hurt, bring me your pain, bring me your anger, bring me your disappointment, bring me your addiction, bring me your lust, bring me your struggle, bring me your disappointment. There is nothing you could bring me, says the Lord, that I can't handle. 
and I will open my arms wide and welcome you. I will welcome, I don't care who has rejected you. I will welcome you into my presence and into my bosom and I will help you be the man I created you to be, says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. That blessed my heart. That blessed my soul right there. So if you're a father, that prophetic word was for you. It doesn't matter what kind of father you are. And if you're anticipating being a father, or you want to be a father one day, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you close to him so that you can know his love and so that you can get healing from all of the abuse, bad information, anything in your past that's stopping you from realizing your potential. Amen and amen. So remember I told you with each video I do this year, I'm trying to increase my reach. And the reason I'm trying to increase my reach is because whenever God sends a prophetic word, then as many people as possible need to hear it so they can be blessed by it and benefit from it. But I can't do that by myself. So in each video, I told you I was going to ask you to do one thing. Not a million things, but each video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Well, here's what I'm going to ask you to do for this video. I'm going to ask you to share this video with every father that you know, or maybe even every man that you know. Take this video. This Facebook link is also on Insta. And in uh, when I get through, I'm going to upload it to YouTube. I want you to share this prophetic word with every man, specifically every father that you know. Share it with them so that the prophetic truths that are coming forth from the Holy Ghost can get in his spirit and get in his ears, okay? So that he can be blessed by this word. All right, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much to those of you that watched me live. Thank you so much to those of you that are watching the replay uh, on Facebook, Insta, YouTube. And I will be here same time next weekend, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. All right. Amen. God bless. Share this with every man and father you know so that he may know and all may know, don't withhold your son. Don't withhold anything from God most high because he wants to heal you and make you the husband and father and the man that he wants you to be. Amen. And God bless.